isn't it? Even though it's, a, it's an understatement in a sense, isn't it really? Yeah. Oh, what a wonderful God. You just can't. How do you put, how do you put into words what God really is? Who he really is? And if you're born again, if you truly know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Saviour, words, words cannot express what the Lord is for us. And uh, I guess that's part of being a fallible human being, but uh, nonetheless. Okay, let's uh, open our Bibles this morning. And let's go to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. And uh, we're going to look at uh, four verses. I'll, I'll, I'll explain why we jump in the chapter a little bit here in a moment. But uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 1, and then verse 7 to verse 9. Romans 8, verse 1 reads, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Then verse 7 to 9. Uh, because the carnal mind is in enmity uh, against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Okay, let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy. Thank you, Lord, for being able to, at this time, uh, Lord, just come aside from the world, delve into the riches of your word. Uh, Lord, lift up our hearts to you in gratitude for who you are and what you've done for us. And uh, Lord, I uh, just do uh, ask that you would let the Holy Spirit of God lead and guide in your word this morning. Lord, may... May the Holy Spirit of God speak to all of our hearts individually. Uh, as you know, we need. And uh, Father, I thank you and praise you for what you're doing. I do ask and pray these things in the name of our Lord and our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. So we have here the Apostle Paul writing to the believers in Rome in general, uh, not specifically to a church. There is a mention of a, uh, of a church in Rome there uh, over in Romans chapter 16, which was meeting in the house of Aquila and Priscilla. Uh, who were Paul's co-laborers in Corinth and even a little bit in, in Ephesus. Uh, Aquila and Priscilla had originally come from Rome, but they were expelled when Claudius Caesar um, uh, expelled all of the Jews from Rome, and that was about uh, 49, I think it was, AD or so. And, uh, and so they met Paul in Corinth, where they'd moved to because of the edict, and that was about 50 AD. So after uh, Claudius Caesar's death, uh, that, uh, that edict was removed, and they returned to Rome, uh, hence at this time approximately 57 AD, uh, there was a church there, many in their house. Now, uh, it wasn't started by Peter, no, he wasn't there. The only thing that we know Peter went to, perhaps went to Rome for, was to be martyred. He didn't go there voluntarily, obviously, but, uh, but nonetheless, so this, this epistle to the, to the Romans is a great a great uh, epistle for doctrine, and uh, it, it has it all. That's probably why uh, somewhere back in the past, uh, amongst the churches, you know, they, they developed the Romans Road. Uh, it's, it's lacking a little bit in respect of uh, giving the full gospel, but uh, if you look hard enough, you can find all of the basic stuff there. And, uh, and so the epistle to the Romans, it has the subject of sin, Romans chapter 3, uh, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Uh, it has the, uh, the, the, the blood of Christ being shed on the cross for us in Romans chapter 3, verse 25. Uh, it addresses the doctrine of, uh, of sorry, eternal security over there in Romans chapter 8, verses 35 to 39, and we'll read that in a minute, so you can turn your Bibles to that. Uh, it addresses the, uh, the, the subject of Israel's look being God's chosen people, though blindness and part has happened unto Israel until the fullness of the time of the Gentiles come in. And you might say, what's that? It means the age of grace that, that we've been in since the time the Lord has ascended back to heaven. And uh, the age of grace, quite frankly, when you look at the Word of God and you, and you look at the prophecies and everything else, uh, we're, we're uh, about to see the closing of the door of, that, of the age of grace, which also means uh, some very interesting things for, for the world and, uh, of course, the blessed hope for the Christians. Now, uh, we'll go to Romans chapter 8. 
and have a look in verses 35 to 39, Romans 8 verses 35 to 39, it says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long, we are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all of these things, sorry, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature that shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You have a wonderful, wonderful passage uh, of assurance. And you know, when you stop and you look at you look at all of those things that uh, that Paul has listed there in that epistle, uh, sorry, this chapter part of the uh, the epistle, uh, those are all things that he experienced. You might say, what, death as well? Yeah, he was stoned to death at Lister in his first missionary journey. Uh, welcome to the ministry, as I like to say. Uh, first missionary journey, he's there in Lister and he gets stoned to death. Uh, it's just the Lord raised him up. They, they'd already thrown his body outside the city as dead. And so, uh, you know, Paul was speaking from experience when he wrote those words. And we know that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And uh, as, it, as it tells us over Timothy and and the Lord gives it to us for a number of reasons, but uh, God used Paul's experience to write what he wrote there. And, uh, and, and I want to think about that subject today. I want to think about the security of the born-again believer. Uh, looking there in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, it says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Now I've had it. I've had it said to me in the past, or a number of years ago, a good number of years ago now, uh, two or three decades ago, in fact. Anyway, uh, it says there, "Who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit." So somebody said, "Well, you know, it says there if you're walking after the flesh, and you're not, you know, you're, gonna, you're not going to be saved." And I said, "No, no, no, that's not what it's saying." And, and so, uh, you know, this morning in Sunday school, we started to study. Uh, hermeneutics, on how, in other words, how to study the Bible, how to rightly divide the word of truth. And so what you've got to do, you've got to read through the whole passage and get the proper context. And so that's why we read over there further over. If you look in verse number 9, it says, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. And let me say this this morning, if you have come to that point in your life where you uh, have seen yourself as a lost sinner before a holy, sinless God, and you've been guilty of your sins, and you, you understand that if you were, believe in your heart, that if you were to pass from this life at that moment, that you would be lost in hell forever and deserve it. And then you accept the Lord Jesus Christ's perfect sacrifice on the cross of Calvary for your sins, for every single one of them. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And so, you know, God has given us the perfect gift and there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. 1 Peter chapter 1, uh, 1 verses 3 to 5 reads, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance oh, incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith, unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Oh, you need to get a hold of that. You are kept by the power of God. Oh, what if I do this? And what if I do that? No, you're kept by the power of God. Amen. You need to let it sink into your heart. If you have truly come to that point, and one I said before about being guilty uh, in your own mind, seeing yourself as guilty in a way that you never had before, before the holy, sinless God of heaven and earth, and you see yourself as that lost sinner, and you ask the Lord to save you, that's what's called repentance. That's all it is. It's not this big, bad, boogeyman word that they try to make out to 
make out the world out there? It's just simply seeing yourself for who you are before the holy, sinless God of heaven and earth and asking him to change your life through salvation. And at that point, you are kept by the power of Almighty God. What happens at that point of, of salvation? Uh, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13 tells us that at the time we believe, we are sealed by the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 3 and 1 Corinthians 6 tells us that our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within us. Within us. How long are we sealed? Well, let's go. Yeah, that's right. Absolutely. Forever. Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And let's have a look there. 1 Thessalonians 5. Verses 23 and 24. A couple, a couple of my favourite verses. 1 Thessalonians 5. Verse 23 and 24. Reads. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. Brethren, if you have the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and only Saviour, He is the God of peace. A peace that the world cannot give, as the Lord said in John chapter 14. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 24. Faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. He will do it. If you have truly committed your soul to the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved for eternity, uh, that's what's going to happen. We've already seen numerous verses so far this morning that show that. We are saved once for all and forever, if we have truly accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as our Lord and Saviour, we are kept by the power of Almighty God. Look, if, if Almighty God could speak the world and the universe into existence, and He did, regardless of what some bonehead scientists will say, He did speak the world and the universe into existence. And if He can do all of that, he can look after one puny little human being for all of eternity. That's right, amen. amen. I don't have some puny little God that fits within the confines of my mind. I have God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, as my Lord and only Saviour. I mentioned this article the other week, but it just amuses me so much. The article was entitled uh, something to do with why haven't aliens contacted us yet? <laughs> and you read it and they go, and, the, and this, the, the people who wrote this article, it was, oh, I think it's called Science Alert or something like that. And they said that they reckon that the reason why aliens haven't contacted us yet is because alien societies have reached the limit of their capabilities. And it'll probably be, I think they said, 400,000 years before aliens will be able to contact us. <laughs> so I sat there and I looked at that and I thought, where do you get that from? You know what they're doing? They're looking at the world and they're seeing us reach the end of our limit, of what we're capable of. I mean, Elon Musk, let's go settle on Mars. Yeah, right. Um... Where's my, where's my order of the, uh, my Smith's crisps and, and my Tim Tams from the store? Well, hang on a minute. The Earth is on the opposite side of the Sun uh, to Mars at this particular time, so you're just going to have to wait, you know, probably a thousand light years until, until we can, uh, you know, uh, you know, crazy stuff. They're thinking about, they're looking at our own human frailty and trying to work out what they think. But I have. Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth, as my Lord, as my Saviour, as, as I trust everyone here this morning has, and if not, then you need to do something about that. But that same God has revealed in here that I am safe forevermore. That's right, amen. 
And it doesn't matter what happens to this body which is wearing out, as we all do. One day I'm going to breathe my last, if the Lord tarries. And I'm going to step off into His presence. And I'm going to be with Him forever and ever and ever. And as that scripture I read out to you before, it says, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled. Oh, praise the Lord, the end of this world of sin. And that fainteth not away, reserved in heaven for you. We have a lively God that has given certain expectations, and I don't mean certain as in the sense of particular, I mean certainty. You ever had, oh, look, you might be thinking, you know, to give an example, you're expecting someone to come, but you don't know whether they will, you know, you'll see them or not. But then when you see in the distance, you can see them and you go, oh, okay, here they come. Then you're certain that they will come. That's what I'm talking about. That kind of certainty. We have a certainty of our expectation in respect of what God has promised. We have an incorruptible inheritance that will never fade away. And that goes with our incorruptible being that we will become when the Lord raises us incorruptible, as is talked about in 1 Corinthians 15. So we will have an incorruptible being, and that's body, soul, and spirit in eternity, will be incorruptible, uh, or there with the Lord in heaven, with an incorruptible inheritance that won't fade away. Now you might say, that's kind of hard to imagine. Yeah, you know why? Because we're not there yet. But this is, what, this is the whole essence of faith. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And, and faith is the evidence of things not seen. We haven't seen them, but we know when we read the word of God, it speaks to our heart, and we know it's true. And when we look at all of the evidences from the word of God that proves the word of God, we look at all of the events that have already happened in the word of God, uh, that were prophesied coming true, like the Lord Jesus Christ coming, for example, first coming. And we know that these things in the Word of God are absolutely correct. So let me ask you this morning, do you have that certainty of your eternity? Do you have it? Are you sure... Without one hunt, without one one bit of doubt, are you sure that you have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and only Saviour by faith alone, not trusting in yourself at all, realizing that if you died without the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Saviour, you would be lost in hell forever, and know that to be the fact in your heart. God has given us an inf infallible guarantee. It's not like something you buy here, you buy something here and they say, you've got a lifetime guarantee with this product, and about two years later it breaks. And you go back and they say, oh, well, sorry, your lifetime guarantee ran out last month. No, no. What God has said, God will do. And I'd like to think about uh, a few points this morning about this, about the fact of having eternal life that will never fade. Point number one, God cannot lie. God cannot lie. Titus chapter 1 verse 2. Have a look in Titus chapter 1 verse 2. In Titus chapter 1 verse 2 it reads, In hope of eternal life, which God, that cannot lie, promised before the world began. If God said so, that's it. That's it. He cannot lie. There was uh, an American fellow that uh, 
Uh, he had some connection to Australia. Maybe his wife was Australian, or no, I think he was raised in Australia, but he, he moved to America at, as a teenager or like that. And he came back, and I'm talking here about 2000, 2002, something around there. And he visited uh, us at the church in Toowoomba. And uh, he had a, his ministry was to go around to the shows, you know, like we had the show here uh, a couple of weeks ago. And uh, he would he would pay for a a site at the show, like in one of the one of the pavilions. And he had set up his table, and he'd have gospel tracts and free books and things like that to give away Bibles, etc. But then he, on the end of the table, he had a he had a box. And it said on the front of the box, look inside to see what God cannot do. And, you know, he's trying to get someone's attention to come and have a look and go, oh, I wonder what God can't do. <laughs> and so they look inside and there's the verse there, uh, in hope of eternal life, which God, uh, that cannot lie, promised before the world began. Nice ministry. Um, obviously got abused a few times, but nonetheless, uh, he... Uh, that was what God laid on his heart. God cannot lie. What about us? How easily do we say something and we go, that wasn't, that wasn't right. It just, it, it's just part of our nature. We don't mean to sometimes, but it just comes out. But God, what God has said, God will do. God cannot lie. And He's promised us eternal life. For example, the Lord Jesus Christ in His earthly ministry said, uh, And I give unto them eternal life. And they shall never perish. Never. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Now, it gives eternal life. The word eternal means without end or existence. Of existence, sorry without end of existence or duration. Everlasting. So again, have you gained the promise of eternal life? Are you sure you have? Another question that I've had you know, put to me at different times through the years, what about when in heaven, if we do like what Lucifer did, you know, he got, had pride and he fell and, and he was lost you know, and now he's the adversary on, on earth. And what about, what about if we're like Lucifer when we get to heaven? Let me just say this, brethren. God not only cannot lie, but he cannot lose. He will not lose us. What do I mean? Let's consider a few verses. John chapter 1, verse 12. John chapter 1, verse 12. If you think as you're doing a quick walking, that's good, but I'm still going to quote the verse. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Now think about that. It's not talking about sons of God just in a general sense. It's talking about the sons of God. We're not going to be, we're not going to be part of the Trinity, obviously. But we will be sons of God. And we'll dig deeper into that. When we become a son of God, the Lord Jesus lives in us. Galatians 2.20 I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So Christ lives in us when we trust him as our Lord and Saviour. 1 Corinthians 3.16 uh, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. The Holy Spirit of God dwells in us and like I said before, he seals us. Ephesians 4.6 tells us that the Father is in us also through Christ Jesus. Now, you put all those together, what do we see? We see the Trinity 
God Almighty, the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, indwelling every born again believer. What's the difference? I'll tell you what the difference is between us and Lucifer. Acts 20 verse 28 shows us that he purchased, purchased you and I that are born again. He purchased us with his own blood. That, that was one of the, the main things of the cross. Yes, it was to pay for our sins. But it was to make a transaction that would last for all of eternity. We are in God if we are saved. He is in us. We are the sons of God and are of his bloodline through Christ's sacrifice on the cross. Now, Lucifer. Lucifer was only created by God. He was given a free will, which uh, Lucifer chose wrong and fell immediately. And while thinking about it, Adam. Adam was only a created being and given a free will. And Adam went against God's command in the garden to not eat of the tree. So he fell. So in respect of eternal life with God, we are not created by God unto eternal life. We are born again into the family of God through the blood of Christ and are his purchased possession. A huge difference. And it's through that one perfect sacrifice forever. And to repeat the words that the Lord said that I quoted before, John 10, 28, And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. No matter what anyone might do to you in this world, if you're truly saved, you're saved. That's it. God cannot lie. Point number two. A born-again believer that truly grasps their eternal security also grasps the power, sorry, I'm having trouble with that word, grasps the power of the presence of God. Let's look in Romans chapter 8, verse 16. Romans 8, verse 16. I'll repeat that again and try and get that word right. A born-again believer that grasps their eternal security also grasps the power of the presence of God. So Romans chapter 8, verse 16, it reads, The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. You know, when, when you accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Saviour, you became a new creature. The Word of God tells us that, 2 Corinthians. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away, behold, all things have become new. We are a new creature in Christ. And so, at that particular point, when you were born again, let me just say this, by the power and working of God alone, your life changes. One of the common things is, well, well, if I accept the Lord Jesus Christ, I have to give up my vices. That's what you're going to tell me to do, isn't it? Uh, no, I'm not going to tell you to do that. That's God's, that's God's duty. That's God's work. That's the power of the Holy Spirit of God working within you, within me, that those things change. And it's in our hands to respond to the working of the Holy Spirit of God within. But if we respond, then we're going to grasp the power of the presence of God within us through the Holy Spirit. And don't take me wrong with what I just said there. Uh, Paul wrote in Romans 6, which I think we'll look at later. He wrote in Romans 6, verses 1 and 2, he said, Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, is what he said next. It doesn't give us license to sin, but at the same time, uh, you know, we should in our lives recognise how God has changed our mind, our thinking. See, this is why I don't have to say, 
you better not do this or you better not do that. That's not what it's about. It's about God having a hold of your heart and the Holy Spirit of God working in your heart where you go, oh, Lord, that's, yeah, that's wrong before you. I'm not going to do that. That's the power of God. That's recognising the power of the presence of God in your life through the Holy Spirit's working. Have a look also in 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. It reads there, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Now, you stop and think about that. Paul is saying, Oh boy, don't, I, I recognise the power of the presence of God in my life. This is what I was, and now he's called me to be the minister uh, of the gospel to the Gentile world. Wow. That's the presence of God and his power working in his life. And so more, the more we grasp the power of God working in us, then the bolder or the more confident we become in our Christian life for the Lord. Point number three. The more we grasp the power of the presence of God, uh, the more sensitive we become to sin. The more sensitive we become to it. Uh, that is because when the, the power of His presence is there, we are also aware of the presence of the Holy Spirit. And I've, and, and I've alluded to this already just a minute ago, but it makes us uncomfortable in the presence of sin that we allow ourselves to get in because then when we are aware of the power of his presence it reminds us that he's watching us 60 seconds of the minute 60 minutes of the hour 24 hours of the day he is always there i always remember a uh, a young guy in the philippines uh, without going into a long story about it we used to do street street uh, uh, ministry. We'd get out in the street and just, yeah, groups of groups of students sitting around. So we'd go and just present the gospel to them down near the university. And uh, this one young guy, he was listening from a distance as we shared the gospel with this other group uh, because he wouldn't come over because he was drunk. And uh, and he, he and his mates, they used to sort of, you know, they used to, they, they were there in the, in the city, they weren't from the city, so they'd come in from the country area and, uh, and they'd get up to all kinds of mischief. And so uh, he heard, uh, and then he asked the pastor that I was working with uh, if, well, sorry, he, was, he asked one of the young guys that we were, had, had already been doing a Bible study with that he knew uh, about us. And so he organised a Bible study to be in his boarding house, where, where he was staying. The night he was to have the Bible study, his, his friends took him in. And so when we went there for the Bible study, he was nowhere to be seen. There was still about oh, you know, 30 or so of the students there. And so we shared the gospel, etc. And you know, some of them accepted the Lord. But we thought, this, guy, this young guy's name was LG. A-L-J-I-E. And uh, we thought, oh well, anyway, maybe you know, that the Lord just wanted it that way. And, uh, and so we found out later that he was actually there, but because he'd had a few drinks, he was hiding in the room right next to where we had the Bible study. And so in that room, uh, he heard the whole gospel, he accepted the Lord as his saviour without us even knowing. And then you talk about a changed life. He became so conscious of his sin that he went around making amends to people for those that he'd sinned against. Just like that. But the devil doesn't like that. And uh, the devil, he was he was down on the street one, you know, one night just after that and... and uh, some of his friends got into a fight and he tried to get in the middle to stop the fight and, uh, and he ended up getting 
getting it. And uh, it, it, the way it came out, the, the, the university found out about it, and, they, and he got the blame when he wasn't doing anything. And so uh, they expelled him from university, and he went home. And I thought, that's the way the devil does it. And uh, anyway, later on, a few years later, I was talking to the, the pastor that I was working with, and uh, back in his home place, you know, he, he went on for the Lord. So praise the Lord, you know. But the thing is, despite what happened to him after he got saved, he was sensitive to the power of the presence of God, and he was also uncomfortable immediately about sin. And that's the working of God. Point number four, the more we experience the power of the presence of God, the more we let the Holy Spirit lead us in life. John 14 verse 7, two verses, I'll get you, get you to turn there. John 14 verse 7, sorry, verse 17. John 14 verse 17. And also uh, Galatians chapter 5. So two places. So John 14 and Galatians chapter 5. John 14 verse number 17. First of all, uh, reads, talking of the Lord Jesus Christ, we'll start in verse 16. The Lord Jesus Christ said there, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. Now, when you read through the, the next couple of chapters, you, you'll see that the Holy Spirit of God is to do all kinds of things, like in uh, chapter 14 still, in verse 26, it says, He shall teach you all things. He shall bring, you, bring all things to your remembrance, etc. And so the, the Holy Spirit of God has got a very active role in your life if you're born again. Now Galatians chapter 5 verse 16, it says, uh, the words of Paul he wrote there, he said, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So what are we seeing there? We're seeing someone, if they walk in the Spirit, as a born again believer, ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So... Uh, you're, going to, you're going to get more and more, hold on to more and more the reality of the Holy Spirit of God within you, and He will lead you in your life as a born again believer. The more you experience the power of His presence, the more you will want God to lead you in your life. And you know, we can see that plainly in Paul's life, time and time again. Uh, time won't allow us to do that now. Point number five. The more we get hold of our eternal security, the more on guard we become about temptation. Uh, John 16, verse 8. Uh, and when he is in the world, talking of the Holy Spirit, and when he is in the world, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. So that's the work of the Holy Spirit in this world today as he has been for the last couple of thousand years almost. He is in this world to reprove us of sin. And the same verse that I just looked at, 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 at there in Galatians 5, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. We really need to be sensitive in our lives uh, to the working of the Holy Spirit of God. Why? Because when you are that way, you become more aware of the areas that you're so easily tempted and you have that desire for God to change your life in those areas. We just don't want to, to, to fail God all the time in those areas that we are so weak in. And He knows where you and where I am weak. He knows. We need to get a hold of the, the, the presence of the power of God so that we become more aware of the areas in our life that we can be ignorant of, that we so easily get tempted in. Have a look in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse number 13. 
1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, it says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. Oh, it's a different world we live in. No, well, it's still all the same principle behind all of the temptations. The temptations are common. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able. You know, in our lives, what, what did Paul say over in Hebrews chapter 12? He said, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset us. We all have our pet weaknesses. We all have our pet, I'll use the word sins, because we do. We've all got our pet sins that we don't want to put aside. And the trouble is if we try to do, if we try to put aside our own sins, our pet sins, in our own strength, it won't work. It's got to be through the working of the Holy Spirit of God in your life. Because God is faithful, unlike us. God is faithful. Verse 13. Who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will, with the temptation, also make a way to escape, that you may be able to bear it. <clears throat> God has the way to escape that temptation that you think that you can't overcome. You know what? Pardon me if, I, if I'm a bit blunt with this, but if you think you can't overcome a, a temptation in your life, you are so wrong. You are so very wrong. <coughs> that is very poor thinking. You are putting God in a lowly position in your life by doing that. God, I've got this problem in my life, I've got this temptation in my life, and I can't overcome it. And God's going, well, here's the way to overcome your temptation. Oh, no, no, God, no, that, no, that won't work. You're, you're taking God off the throne and putting him up lower than what you are by doing that. I'm sorry to be blunt about it, but you are. And you must stop it. God wants a victorious people. God is not interested in just a religious people. He's not interested in a religious people. He's interested in a, in a surrendered, victorious people. God did not save your soul from your sins and, for, and from hell for all of eternity just to let you flop and, and, and have a miserable life. Yes, it's, it is all about ultimately about going to, to heaven for eternity with him. But he wants you to have victory in this life. So he can use your life for his honour and his glory. Amen. We are a selfish people, you know that? We are selfish. But I don't want to do that, self. I don't want to surrender that, selfish. I don't want to listen to that because that's too hard, selfish. Oh, no, I don't think that's workable. No, that's self-speaking. We need to realise God wants us to have victory over the temptations. And he has prepared a way for us to do that. God looks at our excuse book that's, that's written in our hearts and he goes, Really? I've heard that how many billions of times. Brethren, when our flesh gets the better of us, which it does at times, it is dominant. Which means it is overriding the reproving of the Holy Spirit. It doesn't mean we have lost our salvation because we are saved once for all and forever through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ shed on the cross of Calvary. It doesn't mean we've lost it just because we are not on the mountaintop spiritually. It just means we need to practice for Hebrews 4 verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may find mercy and grace to help in time of need. 
God is just waiting for you to come to the throne of grace. If we don't, if we don't avail of God's grace, if we don't go to the throne of grace, God can't bestow more grace upon us. We're just going to go round and round in the, the downward spiral of our own self. Ultimately, ultimately what will happen? Ultimately the Lord needs to reprove us. He needs to correct us. As it talks about over in Hebrews 12 verse 6, for whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. He does it because he loves us. He wants to help us. So brethren, finally we've, we've looked at all of these verses of assurance of God's promises from the Word of God. And the Word of God is the greatest source of assurance as to our security in the Lord. For everything that the Lord has said would happen uh, until this time has come true. You think about all of the things that the Lord uh, had put down in the Word of God prophesied that would happen before this time, they've all come true. Everything the Lord said would come true in this time that we are in now is coming true. And you kind of look, wonder how long it is. And everything that the Lord said will come true, future tense, uh, we can see shaping up, ready to go. We can and must have absolute confidence in the inerrancy, inerrancy of the Word of God for it is from the Lord himself, especially in respect of our eternal security. So to close this morning, 1 John chapter 5, verse 13 reads, These things have I written. These things have I written. Word of God. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know ye have eternal life. Do you know you've got eternal life this morning? Is your life reflective of that? Does your life reflect someone that has the peace and security of God Almighty in their life? Does it reflect a changed life? If you don't have that peace of eternal security this morning, please don't go home without coming and seeing me. We'll see, we'll see somebody from this church from within the church. Just come and see me. Don't, don't go home without salvation. Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. Salvation is free. It just takes an honest, open conscience before God. Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for your grace, your mercy towards us. Lord, I just do pray, Father, as we uh, close this morning, Lord, that you would, Father, just uh, speak to our hearts. Help us to examine where we're at. Lord, help us to be sure in our hearts if we truly trust in the preacher and everyone that's truly trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and Saviour. I pray, Lord, that you would speak to their hearts and and help them to perhaps get a better grasp of that and what that means. Lord, you want us to have the victory. You want us to have the victory, Lord. And Father, I, I just do pray for anyone that, that may not be in that position this morning. They don't know you as the Lord and Saviour, perhaps. Lord, I just pray that the Holy Spirit of God would speak to their hearts this morning. Lord, give them a great burden for their eternity they also will not leave from here this morning uh, without Christ as their Lord and Saviour. So Father, I thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. With all heads bowed and all eyes closed, all heads bowed, all eyes are closed, all heads bowed, all eyes closed, where are you at this morning in your heart? Number one, do you know for sure and certain you have the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and only Saviour. If you do, how is your eternal security in the sense of do you understand if you are truly saved 
that you are truly saved forever and ever and ever and ever. And do you realize then that God wants you to have a victorious Christian life? He wants victory in your life. And, he's, and He has prepared for that. It's called the Holy Spirit. With all heads bowed, all eyes closed, let's spend some time considering these things before the Lord. Let's pray. still praying and you'd like to continue to, to, to pray, please don't stop. Please do not stop if you want to continue to pray. Uh, but if you are finished, let's be upstanding. We're going to sing number 291. We sang it earlier, but it's perfect for this time. Number 291, I am coming Lord. Let's be upstanding as we sing that. Thank you for these things. Lord, I commit them to you and do ask and pray them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.